Uh, my name is Greg. I've been at the user group, uh, I don't know, maybe 90% of the time <laughs> since we started. So uh, that got me the, uh, the esteemed title of co-director, which means I booked the library rooms and Nate bounces ideas off me. So no, uh, no illusions there. Uh, he does great work and I'm appreciative that I can help him out. Uh, so today we're going to talk about uh, just kind of the modern tool set and my experience over the last almost decade working in these technologies and seeing how things have obviously changed and evolved and uh, how it's very easy to fall into the traps of older uh, available technologies and kind of lose sight of what's happening with modern SharePoint, modern O365 and hopefully uh, not setting yourself up for failure down the road. All right. So I've uh, been working in the uh, O365 tool set for over eight years, uh, doing things like business process analysis, software development, and uh, just digital transformation. Nate and I actually met back at University of Kansas a long time ago and uh, did a lot of time there and then uh, worked at a construction engineering company and then uh, did some financial operations stuff. And now I'm with RSM as a consultant for technology, specifically in the O365 stack. Uh, I've done all sorts of implementations uh, around SharePoint, so different versions, 2010, 2013, and online. Used different form tools like InfoPath, done designer work for workflow and for modifying sites and pages, uh, Nintex workflow, you know the basic javascript css just to uh, make your pages pretty and do some fun stuff uh, hitting rest api endpoints and then also a lot of the modern stuff with power apps and power automate um, i will talk about power automate a lot and i'm probably going to call it flow more than once and that's okay we're we're all in the the trust tree when it comes to flow and power automate right now So our general discussion uh, is going to be first about how we think about SharePoint forms and workflows, so just the entire environment. And then we'll get into InfoPath and what works, what doesn't, what needs help. We'll talk, we'll talk some about the modern tools and uh, the variety that you have there. And then finally, I've got a couple of demo items prepared to walk through just to kind of show what's possible and hopefully get your mind uh, moving on things that you could possibly do in your environments. So I've had this conversation a lot uh, in every job I've had for the last eight years about context. And that is um, when you're in an environment, what is the context that you're in? Um, it can be as simple as SharePoint permissions. They are different based on the context you're in. Uh, it could be your workflow. Is it operating locally or is it operating across your environment? Uh, so it's always very important to be aware of your context and just be thinking about what you're doing. Um, so I like to use visualizations for pretty much everything. So we'll start with uh, what a local environment constitutes. So put a picture of a map that say just getting around the town. And that's what most users experience when they start doing things in SharePoint or with Office 365. They're on a site and then maybe they access a form on that site or they upload a document which triggers a workflow that sends a notification. Uh, those are very common things. So when you're interacting with your site, you're doing things locally to it. Um, so again, the example in a SharePoint list, you might have an info path form that's your custom form and then a, an in-text workflow that triggers. And you can trade out a lot of those tools. You know, obviously SharePoint is pretty much the glue that holds it all together but it could be just a standard SharePoint list form, or it could be a SharePoint designer workflow or, or uh, any number of third-party tools or custom stuff. So nowadays, uh, a lot of, at least the clients I interact with and most folks are moving to the cloud or they're already there or in some sort of hybrid environment. And the biggest thing that I wanted to communicate is that changes your context specifically that your actions are really no longer local at all. Uh, they certainly can operate that way. But if you do something like trigger a workflow, it might be sending a push notification to your phone. It might be uh, sending that email, or it could be sending a tweet, or it could be uh, 
uh, copying data to an on-prem data gateway. A lot of stuff that just wasn't possible before we went to the cloud. So it's important to realize that if you are in a context of a cloud environment, you typically have a lot more options. Uh, so great power, great responsibility, but important to remember that uh, you're no longer just getting to something from SharePoint and going out with it. You could be interacting with your environment via Power App that's connected to SharePoint, so it's common, uh, commonplace. And then you could have Power Automate as the workflow on that. Those three products don't live in the same place. They're all in your environment, but it's not that your, your Power App is an extension of your SharePoint form or that Power Automate workflow is an extension of the default actions in your list. There are three separate products that are just well integrated together. So to, to bring this back together into the context of SharePoint and forms and workflows, a lot of the legacy tools that we have out there are still available, but they really just weren't ever designed in a cloud context. They were designed in that local context. So when you look at something like SharePoint site, it's the customizations that are extending SharePoint. So again, the example of an InfoPath form can do a lot more with your form interface than the standard SharePoint form, but it really isn't taking you too far beyond SharePoint. Um, same goes for workflow. A lot of the triggers that you deal with for workflow are gonna be tied to events in SharePoint. So it's a new item on a list or a new document in the library, or maybe when things are modified, or when you've got you know, conditionally executed things. So uh, maybe you've got a status that changes from pending to approved. That's something you can execute workflow on. In a modern context or, or the cloud context, you're really talking about integrations with SharePoint. So it's not just updating a single record, you could maybe be pushing data in batches. So taking a whole bunch of stuff in you know, a Power App and then pushing it into SharePoint all at one time. Uh, additionally, you could be pulling data from non-local sources. So instead of connecting SharePoint resources together, or maybe you've got a resource list that you're pulling into metadata, on a document library. Uh, here you could be pulling data from APIs and incorporating that and then pushing it directly into SharePoint. And just to keep on going there, um, the triggers that you would use for workflow in a modern context can be, you know, they can be much wider. You can do all the things we talked about in a local context. You can, you know, out of the box do things with Power Automate based on new records or modified records or have it run by conditional with a little help. Um, but you can also do things like wait for actions from Power Apps or users to interact on the fly with your, uh, with your uh, automation. You can also wait for you know, endpoint data to come back and then push that data directly into your app. And we'll do some examples to talk about this later on. But again, what I really want to say is that you just have to really expand your thinking about what's possible and uh, you know, steer clear of stuff that's really difficult, but you can certainly do more with less uh, in the cloud context. It's a good place to stop for questions if there's anything coming in from online. Uh, let's see. Not so far. Okay. So let's talk about InfoPath. Uh, I feel like it's a controversial topic now uh, because everyone's been saying don't do it for a while. Uh, but I certainly want to cover it again and talk about why uh, and the risks associated with InfoPath so that we're not uh, just blindly saying we shouldn't be doing it anymore. Uh, to start off, it's a very mature product. It's been around since 2003. So anything with that much weight behind it is going to have a lot of resources. Several of us probably have things like InfoPath Cookbook on our desks. Maybe they haven't been cracked open for a while. But there's certainly a lot of resources. There's a lot of online stuff as well. Uh, it has a simple integration with SharePoint. So, you know, once you've got that installed in your environment, you can go into your SharePoint list and click Edit an InfoPath right from the ribbon. So you don't really have to do too much as far as jumping out to it. Uh, you can embed those customizations of a form directly into a SharePoint page. You can launch your forms in a dialogue. So that integration with SharePoint is, is very well done, and it's easy just to switch back and forth between InfoPath and local stuff. 
Now, some of the features we've probably all used quite a bit during forms development for InfoPath are pretty easy to learn and they're pretty powerful. So things like custom formatting, you know, if you're doing some sort of an indicator or a scoring mechanism, you could change the color of text to indicate, you know, red for a warning, green for good, that kind of stuff. Uh, you can do quite a few rules regarding, you know, if this field equals this, set this field to something else, uh, as well as a lot of custom controls. So it's not just drop downs. You can do Likert scales, you know, whatever, whatever you think uh, works in the context of your business process. Uh, stuff that I've done quite a lot of is things like showing or hiding fields based on context. So if you have a form in a specific status, you might be showing some of your fields. Once it moves to another status, you could you know, hide those and surface other critical data fields. And the last one I had there was just a, uh, things like a drop down control, very common to use uh, on an InfoPath form. And that's just a way to give you a defined list of choices to normalize your data as you put it into SharePoint. So it doesn't have to be a choice field in SharePoint. That's one way to do that. You could have a single line text field in SharePoint, but change that control to a drop down in InfoPath, give your users, you know, whatever the appropriate number of choices are, and then, you know, be assured that that's always going to show up the correct way once it gets to your environment. And then maybe the, uh, the most powerful thing I think about InfoPath is that you have the ability to do different views of your form. It's very analogous to different views in SharePoint being used to, you know, change up what different users see or, you know, based on status, how things change uh, throughout a business process. But having that ability to just kind of in a single form have, you know, three or four different objects that you can totally redo all the fields on, only add fields to, you know, phase one or two and not to phase three can really uh, customize your user experience and get a lot of value out of those forms. So InfoPath, you know, it, it can add a lot of value for you. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the, the issues with that uh, on the next slide. So InfoPath, <laughs> unfortunately, is just dead at this point. There's no additional development happening on it. So it's in your environment, but you know, you're looking at something that is going to work today for you, but it's not going to work in the near future. Uh, there are some quirks to it as well that just never got developed out of it. For example, uh, probably several of you have hit text box wrapping issues with comments in InfoPath. It seems like a very common thing, and depending on which browser you're using, it can behave in different ways in that form, which uh, tends to make your users push back and say this should this should work. <laughs> and you'll test it and see that it works, but different browsers, different behaviors. Uh, there really is no out of the box versioning in InfoPath. Uh, if anyone who's done a lot of InfoPath development will tell you the first thing they do on editing an existing form is you save a copy because you're not going to be able to roll that back. You could do certain things, you know, like rolled into a manifest uh, code editor and, and have some backup stuff, but most people probably aren't at that level of, of needing the, the version control there. So uh, it's basically low tech versioning uh, with InfoPath. Again, it's not under development any longer. I believe our last version was 2013. So you know, we're already five years out of date just in versioning control uh, of the tool. Uh, then we get into the big stuff, at least the way I see it, and that's that it's not mobile friendly. You know, you're going to be hard to find a workforce that isn't at least partially consuming your content via a mobile interface now, and that's simply just not going to work well with an InfoPath form. Uh, there's no native offline or cache capability. Uh, that's something we'll see later on that is native in some of the new tools. Uh, and there certainly are third party add ons that you can utilize to get that functionality. But again, out of the box, you just don't have a way to really uh, save that data if you're in an offline environment or an iPad and then get it to push back in later on. Uh, custom code is something that's supported in InfoPath and it worked great until you move that InfoPath form up into the cloud and then it's not going to work any longer. So that's an experience and a use case I've had where, you know, an older form that was using custom code to strip out attachments and throw them into a document library worked in a 2010 environment, did not work after we moved that to the cloud because of the code restrictions in your O365 environment. 
So it makes you know some of those InfoPath forms that are maybe very well utilized because they're highly functional uh, in older environments. You just don't have a good migration path for them uh, if your environment changes. Uh, SharePoint Modern versus Classic uh, is a gap problem right now. Uh, in the Classic, you can put those InfoPath forms in there. They're going to work as expected. But as soon as you go to a modern interface, they're not going to behave the same way any longer or potentially not launch for you. So as everything SharePoint is moving to modern, everything O365 is moving to modern for the benefits of responsiveness, for uh, just general good stuff that we're getting there, uh, you're just going to be left behind on your form interface. So uh, my assumption, I think most of the community's assumption is that modern is the new standard so classic is here for now, but eventually it's going to phase out. You certainly don't want to have a, a form tied to a format that's going to phase out. And then maybe the most important thing here, and the reason why you get a Batman slap for InfoPath is because support ends in 2026. So if you're building something today on that platform, you're just asking for technical debt down the road. You're going to have to redevelop that form. So if at all possible, avoid it. I know it's tempting, especially if you're just doing a few quick things. But again, someone else, you know, it might be you, it might be someone else down the road, they're going to have to redo that form. So maybe try to do it in uh, a format that's going to allow for, uh, for you to not have to do that pretty soon. Uh, all this can be summarized very well by Mark Rackley, if you're familiar with him. I uh, put out a nice post back in August and uh, Certainly go to that link and look through. He, he talked a little bit more about uh, migration challenges specifically and highlights a lot of the same content. Um, how do I feel about InfoPath? Hopefully it, it doesn't sound all negative. <laughs> uh, and I view this as it was cool. It was great for a long time. Uh, and its functionality really outweighed the problems and a lot, a lot of use cases. It was just the easiest tool to use. It wasn't complicated. I could teach someone else how to do it, especially if you're you know, a person that's having to instruct others how to do forms, maybe uh, business line folks that are getting into SharePoint. This was you know, a way I could stop in for an hour and show them how to do a form. And I'm not talking about a whole new tool or an installation or any of that stuff. So the bottom line is it worked, <laughs> which kind of made us lazy, I think, in a lot of cases. Uh, additionally, it was the right price uh, at three ninety nine. So, you know, basically, technical debt aside, uh, if it's a free tool that they can just add to their environment or or just load up a, a, an InfoPath form without any barriers or pricing considerations, you know, people are going to adopt it. That's uh, that's the bottom line. There are lots of online resources for learning InfoPath. You know, you Google InfoPath this. You're going to get forum posts. You're going to get MVPs talking about it. You're going to get this is how I did it in InfoPath. This is how I do it in another tool type entries that can be super valuable as you're building your skills uh, in a 365 or in SharePoint in general. So you know when you can easily get that type of information, it's going to drive adoption of the platform. Um, but at the end of the day, just because you can do these things, really doesn't mean that you should do these things. And that's I think the where we're at with InfoPath right now is you certainly can use it, but I really recommend you don't use it. Have you run into any cases where you feel like it's still like the number one option? Uh, I Not anymore. Maybe up until what, really when they dropped the custom code uh, when you moved to the cloud and I think we're working on three years with that. Okay. Uh, that was kind of the last thing where there really was nothing in InfoPath that I shouldn't be doing in another platform. All right. So what should we be using? And have to 2020 drop an obligatory baby Yoda into every presentation. So we should be using something that has potential. Uh, we should be using something that will support kind of the modern tool sets as they come along. Again, you're building something in a platform that is no longer under development or that really doesn't have any expansion capabilities. You're just, you know, might as well put a calendar event, you know, five years from then or for your boss and say, okay, we're going to have to redo this process today. 
and we're gonna have to redo it in five years. And I think you'll get a lot of pushback on any kind of um, thought process like that. Um, you also have to support something that has that modern or cloud approach to it. So items that are more about integrating uh, with other products versus extending a single product that may or may not be you know, in the same state uh, down the road. And finally, you have to allow for something that allows you to switch context. So, you know, I, I talked about a local or a cloud context and, um, you know, a lot of the modern tools actually let you flip back and forth between them. So you're just minimizing your training time by staying in one product that can be used in different contexts uh, without really having to change too much. So let's talk about uh, Power Apps. So this has been around for, for a good amount of time now. And so I don't want to get too far in depth, but we'll just talk about what it really means in the context, context of the conversation. So uh, Power Apps, it can be standalone or you can use it to do custom list forms in SharePoint. I think uh, the general use is probably more as a standalone item. The features are a little bit limited when you do custom list forms. You don't get all of the features of, of Power Apps when you do that but it is an option, uh, especially if you're doing modern pages and modern lists and whatnot. It's nice to use the, uh, the Power App form interface for that. It's designed for mobile devices, so you know, that's why I use it a lot because the customers, uh, the clients want to uh, access a form on their iPad or on their phone uh, quite, uh, quite a bit. Uh, you can also incorporate device information from that. So you could use your camera off your phone to take a picture and then incorporate that into your process. You can pull the location. You can even check the connection status. So, you know, uh, you can find cookbook, cookbook examples out there of people, you know, taking a picture on an iPad in an offline mode, tagging a location. And then when you come back online, pushing that data back into your SharePoint environment, and that all becomes possible because of the capabilities of something like Power Apps. Uh, you can do some stuff that is very similar to InfoPath, like embedding it into SharePoint. Uh, had a lot of use cases there, and you can make it function just like an, you know, an on-page form uh, to get that functionality without having to just stay in SharePoint and do a bunch of custom work. So um, it's one of those areas where the integrations are nice because you can use a product inside a page uh, and still keep the features without uh, you know, requiring you to flip-flop between two products. There is a very active online community, uh, so I would say definitely more so than probably any other product in O365 around Power Apps. Uh, there's just a lot of people doing a lot of really interesting things with it. And I think that's credit to Microsoft for you know, putting out as much content as they do so that people can just get inspired and then like to share it with the community. So certainly engage online if you can. You know, I've, I've had a lot of opportunities to you know, meet people and see what they're doing. And then that sparks an idea and a business case that I'm familiar with. And then you go from there. Uh, Power Apps has a, a pretty big catalog of connectors. So yes, it can connect to SharePoint. Um, it can also connect to a lot of different stuff. And so it really supports that idea of a cloud or a uh, kind of a big context that you can pull data from different places. You can build custom connectors where you can just query stuff and, and pull it in. Uh, the connections to the Power Platform are very well integrated. So things like Power, Power Automate doing inline functions or actions uh, is something we'll demo later on here. But the ability to have a form that you launch a workflow and wait for data to come back on, I think is, is something very, very powerful. So we'll talk about that. Uh, another thing that is possible, uh, I've seen several examples, are embedding Power BI dashboards. So you can have a form and you get that feedback, you know, refreshed into it so you can see what's happening with the data you're generating through your whole process. So Power Automate or Flow, and it's okay to call it Flow. <laughs> I think anyone who's done a lot of work in there probably will continue to call it Flow. Uh, for a while, um, <laughs> or maybe forever, because Flow just worked, and it was a great name. He's still kind of salty about the whole Power Automate thing, but, uh, you know, it is what it is. So Power Automate, um, 
it really kind of was the first product in 0365 that made me think about both personal and business automation. So for example, you can treat it like something that sends you, you know, a text or an email based on your location. You can have it, you know, compile emails for you. You can have it do all sorts of stuff in the context of your personal license uh, in 0365. Uh, additionally, you can use a workflow engine. So you can have it doing all those things that you typically see on lists and on libraries or connected to forms. So it's it's really a very powerful tool in that um, you know you can use it for just about anything really, uh, and and that's really supported by the idea that it's not inside SharePoint any longer. It lives outside SharePoint. It connects very easily to it, but it can connect to to pretty much anything and run those automations. Uh, that's a great bullet point that I have next there. So the triggers can be pretty much anything. Uh, for example, I've done exam, uh, uh, you know, use cases where say a process was started in Power Automate via an email being received with a specific subject line and have that strip the attachment out of the email, put it in a OneDrive, send a push notification. So it really is uh, capable of doing a whole lot more than maybe you're used to in, in some of the legacy uh, workflow engines. All that being said, <laughs> the biggest question about those two tools, specifically Power Apps and Power Automate, is that there were some licensing changes back in October. So uh, not everyone is going to necessarily want to stay with those tools just for that reason. So I detailed some of those basic rules here with Power Apps. They moved to a per user or per app uh, model uh, where basically it's, you know, for a per user, it's $40 a month for the full capabilities or per app, $10 per user per month. So it really depends on the scale of your organization, whether you can take advantage of some of that, just, just kind of for everything. Same deal goes with Power Automate the per user or per flow model that I have listed there. Uh, you know, you can do unlimited stuff per user for 15 a month, or you can do those unlimited users for 500 a month. And, and those are really like your, your big heavy duty doing a lot of lifting flows uh, that way. And I'm by no means a, a licensing expert. So um, that's the published stuff from Microsoft. You can certainly look over it. Um, one thing that I've, you know, figured out through just experience on on using Power Automate in different contexts is that some of those features that you maybe were depending on do require uh, to have that that license for it. So whether your you know your environment has your license for it, or we have to get it you know tacked on to it. But things like premium connectors, like doing the uh, uh, web service stuff in Power Automate, does require that premium connection. So just be aware that. You know, if you do the trials, you do the, the flow free runs and whatnot, you can do quite a bit with, uh, with SharePoint with basic resources, but you get to really the, the endpoint stuff, uh, you might be restricted on that. So if you're going to do a project that you think is going to be uh, something that's going to affect a lot of people, certainly make sure that you're at least looking at licensing and understanding what you have available to you in your environment. Uh, your 0365 license, or, or you can see some terminology now, but call it a seated license, uh, will work for most of this, especially if you're, again, tying to SharePoint. Uh, it's really if you get kind of to the edge stuff that you will run into problems. Okay. That's the slides, and we'll transition over to demos. Any other questions coming in from online? See. Not so far. Our licensing really is a big issue. Yeah. I was glad I don't have to handle it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'm going to walk through this once. And this was a use case where I've had something like this happen several times uh, throughout my career where someone wants to do a request form, specifically the example I used here is, is say a vehicle request. Uh, so this is a power app. And uh, 
just walk through the features. So real simple stuff like, you know, hey, it's a form. This could be launched on your, your phone or whatever you, know, you want. But the big thing is you've got some controls to say, OK, what type of vehicle do I want? Uh, let's say I want a jetpack. My location is Missouri. I need a jetpack to get to work. Traffic. And then what makes this form unique is this attachment down here to attach your driver's license. So click the button. And nice about Power Apps, all that stuff happens pretty quick. And you can even see a preview of your attachment in there. Um, but the idea is that with a process like this, I'm actually putting personal information into it. Not only am I saying what's the metadata for my request so that someone could approve it down the line, I'm also putting my driver's license in here. And you know, anyone who does any kind of HR data will tell you that would be a problem. So oftentimes that's been something you would put into a restricted library in SharePoint. It's okay to be there. You just need to make sure that it's in a location where your general users can't find it and where only the people with you know, you know, human resources and whatnot would be able to look at this. So that's a reason to not do this in something like InfoPath because, well, you can put an attachment function uh, or a control on a form, that ability to move stuff around would have to happen once the item hits SharePoint. And so what I've done with this example is I'm actually sending this metadata into SharePoint, but I'm going to send this attachment over to a restricted library. So the idea is that one Power App is going to send two bits of information, the metadata to a SharePoint list, and then the attachment or the picture of a driver's license to a SharePoint library. So click Submit, and that's it. It's done. And here's my request metadata for my demo. And so here's my basic request stuff there. And here is my attachment right there. So I just wanted to walk through kind of thinking there again in that with a power app because it's not an extension of SharePoint you can really start breaking down your process you can say what data needs to live at what point in this case I've, I've scoped the governance so that really only the person who's interacting with the power app sees that and then it goes directly into a restricted uh, library so that I can handle those permissions without needing to you know do any kind of item permissions in SharePoint or you know hope that my workflow fires quick enough so that no one sees that inadvertently. Okay. And I always like to at least show you some of how I'm doing stuff on a demo. So let's peek behind the curtain here. And just talk a little bit about features in Power Apps. And hope that you know it doesn't crash painfully on us. So again, just kind of making the assumption that that most of you have at least touched Power Apps and have seen the interface before. Uh, really, the work here is being done by our submit button. And what you can see is we're doing some patching over to our SharePoint list, and that's everything up here until our semicolon. Uh, so that's just pushing data directly into SharePoint. It's taking what are the fields on your form and then doing a patch action where it will you know, send it to SharePoint. There's a couple of ways to do that. I chose patch for this. Uh, the second part after the semicolon is actually running a flow. Anytime you see that run in the formula, that's what it's doing, <clears throat> where it's picking the data from Power Apps and then it's depositing that into the library. So a couple of things there that are interesting in that you've got actually a flow running or in the Power Automate. <laughs> I told you I'm going to mess that up <laughs> for like the next year. Uh, and, and you never saw it. You never triggered it, you know, manually. You know, there wasn't really anything that said, hey, I'm using a flow here. It just is there in the background. Uh, so that's how smooth the integration can be. Uh, and then also just something that, you know, I've done a lot of, but I you know some people haven't that 
semicolon there lets you do multiple actions. So it's almost like running a, run, a, a rule with multiple actions in InfoPath, where you can say do this, then do that. You, know, you can have any number of stuff in here. Obviously, it's going to affect your runtime, but uh, always remember that you can certainly stack up your actions like this. So for the demo, send my stuff to SharePoint, then when you're done with that, send the image over to uh, the document library. Right? Uh, are you going to show the demo in? I certainly can. Because I'm just curious about that dot run method. I mean, I'm not calling it a method because I've done some programming. <laughs> it's a method call. But where does it get the parameters in the flow? Yeah. So, trigger or? name of the flow here. Right. Upload a photo, SharePoint to Power Apps. That's actually a template. I hardly ever use template flows, but they've got one that works in this mm -hmm. case. And then the run is your your function. Anything in the parentheses is going to say what are the parameters that I'm feeding it. Mm -hmm. In this case, I'm feeding it a file name and the actual image content. Uh, the fact that you can use that image control and the dot image of it is something new that I learned watching a, a, a chain cows uh, video recently about getting the actual image property uh, string versus the uh, the binary stuff on it. So that's something you can certainly do. But the flow is super simple. Anytime you see that power app at the top, it's saying it's waiting for power app to sure. initiate. And then the create file is simply pulling in you know, from the address. That's where it's going. Okay, so these are the two parameters I passed at the file name and the file content. The trigger. Is this like how does it how does it know that it only needs or is waiting for two parameters? I mean, what, I mean. So it's actually done through Power Apps. You say I want to associate a flow. Okay. Again, a <laughs> flow with <laughs> a button, <laughs> and then when you associate, it's going to say this flow requires these two parameters. Okay. So mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, best practice I've found on that is build your flow first then go and add it in Power Apps so that it's going to ask you for the correct parameters. If you make any changes with the uh, with the flow, usually best to actually remove the flow from the Power App and then add it back in again so that it resets all that data stuff. <laughs> now the refresh does, really doesn't work very well. Dissociate it, redo it, you'll have much better yeah, luck. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, two-step. And this is just saying it's waiting for Power Apps right. to launch it. So if you see that, so then the, you've got a Power App that's got to run in it that says do this. Okay. So when you went and tried to associate that to your Power App, it saw what that connector needed? Well, and kind of said, hey, if you want to do this, you're going to have to give me something quick. It's 0365, so it's tied to your license. So it went and saw what have I built okay. that has this Power App connector on it. It's going to okay. give you a list. Okay. And then it asks for whatever parameters you want. In this case, I built in these two parameters. So it asks to input well those two. Like, like say I wanted to have a column on the image library just to, so that it would know which record from the other thing that's associated. I mean, you could certainly pass additional stuff through. Yep. And the second example will do I actually do a third parameter uh, for a query source. So that might make a little bit more sense uh, for what you're trying to do there. Well, I mean, I'm not, I don't have a use case in mind right now, but some neuron like but some, something's percolating. Yeah, That's so always good. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Any any questions from online about that? Uh, let's see. No, I have a question though. The yep. name of the flow didn't have any spaces or anything. Did it choose that for you? In the function there? Yeah. Or is there a, yeah. Yes, this guy right there. Where do you get that? Yeah, so that comes from the flow. And in this case, it just took it and smushed it. actually just smushed it. So this is something we're all very happy that Microsoft has started to do is white space instead of being replaced is now starting to get uh, just camel cased yeah, no automatically. No percent 20s, <laughs> none of that stuff. So you just need to take the spaces out in that case? 
Uh, so uh, this was a template, so I didn't name it oh, okay. at all. Mm -hmm. And just when you went into flow, you start typing, it will just bring you the camel case okay. version and it operates correctly. Perfect. So, but it didn't give you a chance to come up with a name. No, you could edit the name of whatever. Yeah. Being a template, it gives you a default one. Uh, if you don't, I think you have to name it. So, well, if I you don't like blank. Power Apps anything. When you were in Power Apps and said go to this flow, it returned that to you. Just this is what you yeah. need to use. Yep. Yeah, when you associate your flow with the button, it actually gives you this formula up through the first parentheses. It'll say, okay, here's your flow, and then your run method, and then what do you want to do after that? <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Okay. Is there anything besides that one? I don't know. That's something I can And the do. parameters, yeah. <laughs> I'll just clear up it myself. Yeah. All right. So let's move to my second example. And again, these forms are, are they're demo stuff. They're not super exciting visually. But uh, this example, uh, this is a power app that I'm using, again, a flow with in order to pull data from an exterior source. So. Hey, Greg, can you uh, stop sharing and share again, maybe? Uh-huh. We're still seeing the vehicle request form. Uh-oh. <laughs> All right, we're seeing that? Yeah, that's good. Perfect, thanks. Oh, excellent. All right, so this is a form connecting to the NASA Open API, uh, specifically to pull images from the Mars rovers. So uh, you can register at the NASA site and get a public key. Uh, it's uh, one of those nice things our tax dollars pay for, so please do so. Uh, but the example here, I've got just a simple form with three rovers and what day in their mission. And I just have it running up the first 100 days right now. And then which camera? We're going to pull the forward or the rear hazard avoidance camera. So, no guarantees this will pull up off this specific combination, but let's try it. Nope, that's why I tried some earlier. Let me go up to Sol 74 for curiosity. All right, there we go. So it's very quick, which I really like um, with the Power Automate responses, and that it's pulling an image and a little bit of metadata that I brought along with it. And in this case, I don't know how well this is going to come across, but it looks like, you know, barren wasteland and there's your rover and all that stuff. And this is all just out in the public domain. So, you know, in this case, I kind of was thinking about something where you might just want to look through this stuff and a quick way to browse those images with some basic parameters to, to function. Uh, you want to switch it to the rear one. And requery, there's the rear camera. Okay. And just to walk through the rest of the form, opportunity. Looks a little bit different. It's a little bit more angular, blocky, which I thought was kind of interesting. And this is going all the way back to 2004 with this data. And if we go to Spirit. Again, 2004, see the camera arm out there and it's doing all digging and experiments. So I know this is geeky stuff, but it's fun to play with as in an idea of what you can do with a power app. So my next kind of thinking was something like this is, you know, here I'm just browsing this data, but this is data I'm pulling from an API. Now I can push this into SharePoint. I could say I want to tag a few of these and throw them into a SharePoint library maybe for my media team to do a presentation. This is just a way for me to, to go browse that with some parameters. Uh, again, you know, whatever you want to do with this stuff, it's really your, your imagination is the only limitation. Uh, but that's an image viewer with metadata, some parameters, and again, this is querying a, a public endpoint. So once again, let's do the, how is this done?
Christ and Savior and getting things ready. <laughs> and it's a pretty simple form, basic controls. The gallery does all the heavy lifting as far as showing you what to do. Magic button with a long formula. So this time I have it running a collection called the flow query that's running this get rover data. And it's got three parameters that I'm passing into it, specifically the values of this dropdown, the slider control, and the camera option. Uh, the API requires that you pick which rover and then which day. And then you have like 18 different camera options. This would be the, the two that I thought look the, the most uh, consistent and interesting. So that's really all it does. The image itself, uh, but we said Curiosity 74 is a good one. Always nice to get some data into your form to, uh, to look at stuff. And now in the gallery, you can see, okay, this is the item. It's pulling in from that flow query. And here's the picture, here's the birth date metadata, here's the full name of the camera metadata. Uh, this flow is actually a little bit more challenging. So definitely let's, let's go and take a look at it. So this one, I did have to use a premium connector for the web service call. So same as before, we're waiting for Power Apps to launch it, but then Here's our API, and this is all detailed out on the NASA documents if you want to check that out. There's there's many endpoints. I think there was like 50 of them. Uh, I initially started pulling the near-Earth collision stuff for asteroids, but I thought it's a little bit apocalyptic, so let's, let's look at pictures uh, from Mars instead. Uh, but here's the stuff we're passing in. So here's our, our URI, I'm passing in which rover, Passing in which date, patching in which camera, putting in my public key, which now the world has seen. So uh, I do some JSON parsing, and then I map that to the specific metadata that I wanted to pull back into my collection in Power Apps. You can see the response that gets built out based on your schema. In my picture, Earth date, full date, full name, and and when I come back into Power Apps, I can just pick those items from the this item menu in that collection. Okay. Like I said, you can do quite a bit more with that. You could do a sub gallery. You could do additional filters. There's there's many other parameters out there. Again, cool. um, it's great stuff to experiment with so as far as those public options. Yeah. Is this what's building that collection? The response. Yep. Again, from Power Apps. We are doing that collection, basically building it out and then running our query and then inserting those three parameters to get the right URI constructed to pull data back. So I've used this uh, for endpoint data. Uh, while this one used a premium connector for HTTP, you could do this with, say, SharePoint and just use a SharePoint REST query to pull in a bunch of stuff. And if you're getting people, that means you're getting all the information from that profile. So you could pull in a person's uh, picture, their title, their manager, um, any metadata that you've got out there associated, years of service, um, all sorts of stuff to make some sort of a, a selector interface and say, I want to pull people who have been here 10 years and then maybe that live in a certain region. And then eventually say these three people I want to send an email to. So. Lots of different options. Yeah. Very cool. Okay. So now that we've done some demos and thankfully they didn't crash and burn. <laughs> I just want to uh, wrap up by saying, uh, you know, there really are no great answers on kind of how we're moving forward with these tools. They are constantly evolving. There are roadmaps, there are announcements, it seems like every week in a lot of cases. Uh, so just make sure that you are staying in touch with these advancements uh, because you might have a business case that you couldn't do that now you can do. Um, and that's really something where you can add value to your to your uh, company or to your client uh, when they hit a roadblock before you can say, no, I saw that it can do this now. And that's the biggest reason I think to stick with these modern tools is because 
things do become possible. Whereas if you stick with the older InfoPath local context stuff, you've really hit dead ends and they're not gonna just magically open up for you. So stay up to date with this stuff, engage with the community online, come to user groups, uh, learn stuff, uh, always willing to engage and answer questions that people have uh, things online. My Twitter handle and stuff is uh, in my contact information or I can put it out uh, along with the presentation after this. But if you guys have questions, I'm certainly willing to uh, talk about a concept, see what what I think is possible with what you've got to work with or, uh, you know, share. I've seen someone else do this on a blog somewhere and, and you'll know, go down that path. So it's everything I have for today. So thank you for your time. Cool. Thank you.